Honduras, it's uh, one of the most dangerous places in the world to be an environmental activist. The case of Berta Cáceres is emblematic. It's a microcosm of, of the situation in Honduras for many activists and defenders. Berta Cáceres, one of the country's most well-known indigenous environmental leaders, she was gunned down in her home early Thursday, less than a year after she won the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize. This particular murder was particularly brazen. Someone thought that they could murder a very, very prominent person, uh, that they would be able to get away with that. This is a story that I had been following since the actual murder in 2016. And as I followed it over the years, the investigation evolved. It kept taking different twists and turns. There is no evidence whatsoever that could link me to the killing of Berta. Yo creo que luchar por la justicia para una madre asesinada no es lo que nadie quiere hacer, pero necesitamos justicia. Un país sin justicia, verdad, no tiene la oportunidad de salir adelante. Berta Cáceres was born into a very political family, a family of activists, really. Her mother was one of the first female mayors in Honduras. She was the mayor of a town called La Esperanza. In that time, for us, for women, it was very difficult. And the men did not allow us. They thought that we could not do that. Bertita aprendió mucho de mí porque me acompañaba cuando iba a las comunidades a, a organizar para lanzar mi candidatura como alcaldesa. Y eso la llevó a ella a conocer las necesidades de cada una de las comunidades y el estado de indefensión en que vivían especialmente las mujeres indígenas. Berta, she was raised a Catholic. She was not raised in a traditionally indigenous household. But by the time she reached her 20s, she identified as a Linka woman. That's the biggest indigenous group native to Honduras. De los ríos somos custodios ancestrales del pueblo Linka. En nuestras cosmovisiones somos seres surgidos de la tierra, el agua y el maíz. She co-founded a human rights organization called COPIN that was basically for indigenous communities in Honduras. And so by her 30s, she was a national leader. She was someone who was extremely passionate about uh, the rights of the downtrodden, the marginalized, the indigenous in her country. She was also very amiable, very pleasant, very friendly. Um, she was good fun, but behind the kind of laughter and the smiles, you knew that she had a steely call. Ese es el río, el río gran, el río por la que, la que lo asesinaron, el río de Hualcarque. Angry protesters at the doorsteps of Honduras' presidential palace want President Manuel Zelaya back. There was a coup in Honduras in 2009, and the government that took over really put development as one of the main priorities for the country. And with that came this big building boom. Honduras does not produce many natural resources that can be used for energy, but one thing that it does have is a lot of rivers. So you had a lot of hydroelectric dams that suddenly were slated for areas where there was very little development. One of these companies that formed at this time was called DESA, and its sole purpose was to develop the Awazarka Dam in western Honduras. You had international development banks funding it, along with private investment in Honduras. And Berta Cáceres heard about this project, knew that there was a Linka community that lived nearby, and she really sort of led an opposition movement no podemos ser ingenuos ante ese poder represivo que hay ahora en este país. 
the residents worried that the dam project would flood out the areas that were critical for them to grow staples like corn and coffee. But even more than that, they argued that the river itself was sacred and that to dam it in this way was a violation of Lenca tradition. A esta niñez, a decirles, vaya jóvenes, ustedes cuiden sus tierras, ustedes cuiden todo el territorio, porque una sola persona no defiende nada. Adelante el pueblo, adelante Honduras, compañeras. ¿Quieren la represa? ¡No! ¡No! Residents began staging protests, doing things like creating roadblocks. They would stack stones on the roads so construction equipment could not reach the work site. If you talk to DESA, the hydroelectric company, they will say that the majority of people in the communities living around the river supported the project. This is a point of contention. Tantos años que tienen varios de ustedes que han solo visto pasar el agua y nunca le hemos utilizado. Hay que la Mire la desgracia que usted nos vino a hacer a nuestro pueblo. They argue that the community was in support of the dam although there were protests and marches um, going on at the same time. Aquí con propiedad que la mayoría de la gente está a favor de la represa. No, no, no. DESA decided this is a project that it would move forward with without consultation with local communities. And there has been just a tremendous amount of bloodshed and violence. On July 15th, 2013, there was a spontaneous impromptu rally at the DESA work site. And this is a date that everybody on both sides of this conflict remembers very well. Tomas Garcia, who was a coping protester, was among a crowd who entered the DESA work site. And one of the guards, a security guard, shot and killed Tomas and shot and wounded his son, Alan. Right after the violence happened, Dessa's contractor, Sino Hydro, pulled out of the project. They abandoned the work site and they never came back. El 15 de julio, la comunidad estaba haciendo una acción de control territorial. Ese día, la comunidad expulsó a Sino Hydro. Sino Hydro, ese fue su último día que estuvo aquí en la tejera. DESA, instead of abandoning the project, they actually redesigned it. So they moved the site of the dam two kilometers upriver. And they also downsized it to be a, what's called a run of the river project. So there's less impact to the environment, but as the protesters contended, there's not zero impact. So they have their first public protest against the dam in its new location in November of 2015. And that's when we think that plans to murder Berta really began to materialize. She would tell a lot of her friends that she would be getting threats from people at DESA. You, you better watch out, watch your back. She reported cars following her on the roads. You know, she would often look, look behind her shoulder. Um, she had people who would help her with, with, with security. She was definitely scared. She knew she was, she was at risk. Yo siempre le decía, Bertita, retirate, deja de todos modos, pero me dijo, no, tengo un compromiso. Estos desgraciados quieren acabar con todo. Son malditos porque producen maldad. Y eso es lo que nos viene. Viene dura, viene dura la cosa. In 2015, she won the Goldman Prize, which is sometimes called the Green Nobel. It's really the biggest prize an environmental activist can get. And it really kind of pushed her up into a different level of notoriety. 
nuestras conciencias serán sacudidas por el hecho de estar solo contemplando la autodestrucción basada en la depredación capitalista, racista y patriarcal. With hindsight, um, maybe we could say that the Golden Prize put at greater risk is something that is we need to grapple with as international, you know, human rights community. Whether we think that it's a deterrent effect to be able to raise someone's profile in the media, or if that puts them at greater risk, it's very hard to say. Dedico este premio a las y los mártires por la defensa de los bienes de la naturaleza. Muchas gracias. The prize also came with $175,000 as a cash award. And so Berta went back to Honduras and a lot of that money she poured into Copine, into new projects and new facilities in La Esperanza. In March of 2016, she had actually put together a workshop in La Esperanza. And one of the people who was speaking at this workshop was named Gustavo Castro. He's an environmentalist from Mexico. He was planning on staying at another house with someone else in La Esperanza, and he went out to visit Berta and saw how isolated her house was. This house was located on the outskirts of La Esperanza, on the far edge of town. And they started chatting, and she ended up inviting him to stay in her guest bedroom. <laughs> Gustavo was in his room, in the guest bedroom, and Berta was down the hall. And Gustavo heard a noise in the kitchen. Entonces de repente, ¡pah! Se oyó un trancazo bien fuerte que me asusté. Y entonces inmediatamente, yo creo que Berta abrió la puerta y dijo, ¿Quién anda ahí? Before he could even leave the room to check things out, he heard the bangs. There were gunshots coming from Berta's room. Y entra un tipo. Y él dice, como que, ¿qué hacemos con este? Y entonces tomó la decisión de matarme. Pasó la pala por aquí y me llevó parte de la oreja. Él pensó que me había matado. The gunman apparently thought that he was dead and left. And after he heard the gunman leave the house, he got up and checked on Berta. Gustavo searched around for a telephone, found Berta's phone, and just started calling everybody on her contacts. When he eventually did contact people, friends of Berta's, they advised him not to call the police. I think it's safe to say that oftentimes the police were part of the problem, not part of the solution. There are terrible stories of the police hierarchy being, being involved in murder-for-hire schemes. If you called the police, they may be as likely to shake you down as they were to help you. So, friends of Berta's helped get him to another house, and the police, when they did arrive, they found his suitcase in the spare bedroom, and so the police identified him as a suspect. But pretty much everyone who was close to Berta simply assumed that this had something to do with her opposition to the dam project. Una noticia que creo que se puede comparar con que le 
pensar, tengo un puñal en el corazón, sabía de las amenazas, pero nunca creí que iban a llegar a asesinarla en, en su propia casa. It was a complete shock. It was a shock, but at the same time, it wasn't a surprise, if that makes sense, because of the people that she was fighting against. The fact that Berta was killed, it was very clear to us in the human rights community that if Berta could be killed with impunity, any of us could be killed. I think everyone saw this as, as a test. Would Honduras be up to the challenge of investigating this murder in a professional way and taking it wherever it might lead? Or would this notion of impunity carry the day? From the beginning, it seemed like the police were wanting to classify this as a crime of passion. So they were looking at Gustavo Castro as a person of interest. He had been in the house with her. He's been shot twice. The Mexican ambassador tried to get him out of Honduras. He's now been taken again back to La Esperanza, where he was shot and she was assassinated. Bueno, cuando dijeron que uno de los sospechosos era Gustavo, me pareció una cosa bastante absurda. Eh, porque a Gustavo Castro nosotros le conocemos desde que somos muy pequeñitas. I thought this was a classic way to try and defect from the real perpetrators, particularly when a, when a woman is the victim, um, that they think that a crime of passion is something that people will swallow. Entonces, eh, bueno, eso nosotros intentamos desde ahí empezar a luchar por eh, la verdad frente a su crimen. Berta's daughters were really instrumental in trying to push the police into looking at the company, DESA. They reached out to other activists around the world for people to spread the word about what had happened. I'm calling on the Honduran government to conduct a thorough and transparent investigation into the tragic murder of Berta Cáceres. It doesn't look like they're going to get justice or proper investigations unless outside protest really puts pressure on the Honduran government. I think a lot of media attention all over the world put pressure on the Honduran state to, to act responsibly and to do a, a genuine investigation. Si no fuera que, que hubo tantísimas movilizaciones, tantísima presión nacional e internacional, hubiera quedado en impunidad. Por fin las autoridades habían escuchado el planteamiento de que el crimen venía de la empresa y no no de Gustavo. Gustavo was finally allowed to leave and essentially his name was cleared and the focus of the investigation now turned directly towards Dessa. The police began analyzing phone data. So they looked at the cell phone towers closest to Berta's house and found the phones that were active in the area at the time of the murder. And so they began putting the pieces together. On May 2nd, 2016, police launched a series of raids early in the morning, and they arrested several people that they alleged were involved in the murder. And these included alleged hitmen, Mariano Diaz, who was accused of being a middleman, and Douglas Bustillo, who was a former security chief for DESA. Really, the most important thing that came of those raids was what the police were able to collect the cell phones of the people who were arrested. They were able to retrieve thousands and thousands of text messages that became very critical to reconstruct what happened in this murder. I received a call from a colleague 
and I was asked to participate in, in the investigation. I was told that the family didn't uh, trust Honduran authorities and that they wanted an independent investigation of the murder. Yo sabía que ahí eh, ya había esa oportunidad de meterle fuerza, pero nosotros no teníamos ninguna confianza en el Ministerio Público que criminalizó, judicializó a nuestra madre en vida. The public prosecutor had access to really a treasure trove of digital data, and they gave us access to a small fraction and we used that to identify the parameters of the murder plot. So Berta was killed on March 2nd, 2016. On February 6th, the month before her death, we can see in the text probably the first attempt on Berta's life. This man named Henry Hernandez is sent to the town of La Esperanza where Berta was. And he's supposed to be met there by Mariano Diaz, an active member of the military. We know that because Mariano Diaz's phone had been tapped because he was being investigated for involvement in drug trafficking. And the transcripts of, the, of those wiretaps demonstrate that Mariano Diaz is going to get Hernandez a gun. At the same time, Mariano Diaz is in conversation with Douglas Bustillo, former head of security of DESA. Douglas Bustillo is asking Mariano Diaz questions like, have you gotten on the bus? Are you there yet? Later, Douglas Bustillo texts David Castillo, the president of the company, DESA, and tells him, mission aborted. So that mission was abandoned because Berta was not alone. She, her family was visiting her, and so there wasn't really an opportunity to execute the plan. Additionally, when the investigators were looking into Douglas Bustillo's phone, they found images of Berta on it and also um, pictures that he'd taken of her house. So they believe he was essentially stalking Berta. And then later, around the time of the murder, they saw that Douglas Bustillo was in contact with the hitman. So the investigators were able to make that link from the hitman through the middleman, through Douglas Bustillo, to the executives at DESA to kind of piece together what they describe as this long-running corporate conspiracy to try to kill Berta. And so the investigation really led to the CEO of DESA, David Castillo. So David Castillo was taken into custody in March of 2018. I visited Castillo early in 2020, and he was being held at a military prison just outside of Tegucigalpa. And so I was able to sit down with him in his cell and conduct a couple of interviews with him. I did not participate in the murder of Berta Cáceres. There is no evidence whatsoever that could link me to the killing of Berta. David Castillo becomes involved in DESA when he is still a member of the military. He's integral to establishing, founding DESA. And we were particularly interested in his background as a military intelligence officer. So David essentially says that the prosecutors have totally misinterpreted these texts that, for example, whenever there was a mission that was aborted, that they talk about it being a mission to kill Berta. He says no, that it was something completely different, and they've twisted the meaning to implicate him. It had to do with a solar power plant. Okay. So the mission aborted was like, I am not going to travel to do the reconnaissance to the solar uh, project anymore. So one of David's main points is 
he insists that he and Berta were actually good friends. I visited Berta in La Esperanza multiple times. And she also visited me in Tegucigalpa. Uh, we begin more of a friendly relationship in which we don't discuss the project so much. And uh, we, we had a good time, like friends. He has text messages that his defense has pulled from his phone between him and Berta. And many of these messages do indicate a friendship. Mi mami me dijo, este hombre es un hombre amable, que se hace el amistoso, pero que él era una persona mucho más peligrosa que quienes abiertamente le amenazaban. She was very suspicious of David Castillo and his motives. That doesn't mean that she did not regard it as strategic to have a relationship with him. Tenía en cierto sentido una esperanza de transformar su mentalidad y de que eh, desistiera eh, de construir este proyecto. What we can also see is that he is contacting Berta, having conversations with her, obtaining information about her whereabouts and her activities, and then funneling that information to the company executives and employees. How I interpret this dynamic is, is quite typical of a military intelligence officer. It's using Berta as human intelligence to inform how the company wants to handle opposition to the dam project. Berta was my friend. It could not bring my mind to do any harm, not only to Berta, to any human being. I could not believe how evidence was manufactured that it would lead to an accusation. It's unjust what I'm going through. I think it's fair to say that in Honduras, people have been able to get away with murder. The often quoted statistic is that only about 3% of murders in Honduras were solved. So I think if you had asked people on that terrible morning when Berta Cáceres was murdered, if they thought that people would be held to account for this crime, I think most people would have said no. Now, the question, of course, is, is that the ultimate chain of command for, for the murder or not? No estaremos conformes hasta que se castigue a los autores intelectuales de este asesinato donde están involucrados la Junta Directiva de la Empresa de Desarrollos Energéticos S.A. So this investigation started with the hitmen, essentially, the people who pulled the trigger. It went to David Castillo, the CEO, and that executive level. And now the Caceres family is sort of testing this concept to see how far you can extend this. So now they're going after actually the investors in the dam project. Bueno, nosotras en particular tenemos una demanda civil contra el Banco de Desarrollo Holandés FMO, que es una demanda por negligencia ya que nosotros sabemos que tenían información suficiente para saber lo que estaba pasando y no hicieron nada para evitarlo. I think it's far too easy for investors to separate themselves from the impacts of their money, which is usually in the global south. You know, it's their money which is facilitating and being used to carry out the projects which are linked to so many of these cases of, of attacks and killings of activists. ¿Cuál es el legado de su hija, mamá Berta? Bueno, en primer lugar, haber dejado un pueblo organizado, en haber enseñado a los pueblos indígenas de que deben defender su, sus territorios, 
que tuvieran derecho a la, a la educación, a la salud. Ella continúa viviendo y en todas las luchas de todos los pueblos. Nosotras siempre hemos sentido, ¿verdad?, que ella nos acompaña, siempre nos ha acompañado y por eso también sentimos la fortaleza de emprender esta lucha y eso es como, bueno, para nosotras de lo más importante. Berta's supporters and her family came up with a slogan almost immediately after she was murdered and it's translated, Berta wasn't killed, she multiplied. That's the message that they take from this, that even though her killers tried to silence her, her voice is louder now than it had ever been during her life. La madre tierra, militarizada, cercada, envenenada, nos exige actuar. Despertemos, despertemos humanidad. Ya no hay tiempo, 